All right, well, welcome. Uh, today is our last presentation in our integrating testing into your development flow. Our topic today is going to be regression testing. Up until now, we've had a long uh, process of talking about kind of the whole software test life cycle and the full overview of uh, kind of applying testing at every single stage of your development process. We looked at how to write testable code. We looked at the different types of documents and uh, requirement documents you can build at the beginning, uh, like your test strategy, test plan. Also from those, we built our test cases. Uh, we also looked at the different levels of testing, our unit testing, our acceptance testing, system testing, and now regression testing. We also looked at other, <clears throat> excuse me, we also looked at using TestNG and Selenium to build automated test uh, scripts to actually simulate a manual testing of a, a web application. And you can also use the same things for mobile applications as the tools are now getting better and more uh, available for testing. And we looked at the different types of software patterns out there like black box, white box, uh, and other types of uh, patterns. Which brings us to today where we're gonna talk about what is regression testing? Who do typically does the regression testing? When is the, retesting, when is the regression testing done? Why is regression testing important? How do we re actually do the regression testing? Uh, the different types of regression testing, there's actually about seven uh, or eight of them, and we're gonna look at each one individually. Uh, and the different types of tools, we've already mentioned one, the test NG and Selenium, and we'll look at some others. And then finally, we'll look at uh, how do we actually handle the bugs if we discover any during regression testing. So first, we're going to start out by talking about what is regression testing. Well, regression testing is the process of rerunning functional and non-functional tests to ensure that the previously developed and tested software still performs after a change. Now, we do this because sometimes a change impacts the analysis, um, is performed to determine an appropriate subset of tests, like non-regression analysis. Um, Regression testing is something that you really want to do at the end of your process. And this is where we really want to go through and retest everything at the end. Who does regression testing? Well, regression testing is done by a combination of QA testers and developers doing a combination of manual and automated testing against the final build of an application. We typically don't want to do regression testing too early in the cycle, because if you're still having changes being made to the system, doing an early regression testing is more like a smoke testing than a regression testing. So here, uh, when is regression testing done? So I found this really good diagram kind of showing the differences between SDLC and the STLC which is the software development life cycle versus the software test life cycle. Now, typically our regression testing will come in at the testing stage on, STL, uh, on SDLC and the test execution side on STLC. Now, once regression testing is done, typically on the STLC side is when we roll into the test closure phase and on the SDLC side is typically after the tests are closed, then we roll out our software. The software goes to deployment. So regression testing is done again after the functional testing has concluded. That is to verify that other functionalities are still working. Now in the corporate world, regression testing has traditionally been performed by the software quality assurance team, QA, uh, and the development team after they've completed their work. Now, the reason the development team is included here is because they can go back, once we have the final build, they can go and rerun all their functional unit testing that they have within the software. Now, with the testers, with the QA uh, analysis uh, testers, they typically will go through regression testing in a form of manual and automated testing.
Now, why is regression testing important? Well, regression testing increases our chances of detecting bugs caused by changes to a software and application, either through enhancements or defect fixes. Regression testing also detects uh, undesirable side effects that can be caused when we change uh, either an operating system, we change a browser, we change a different mobile device. So regression testing takes the software as a whole and retests it against many different aspects. Now, one thing not to get confused is, what is the difference between regression testing and retesting? So retesting means when you're testing the functionality or bug again to ensure that the code is fixed. If it is not fixed, the defect needs to be reopened. And if it is fixed, the defect is closed. And regression testing, again, means that we're testing the software application when it undergoes a code change to ensure that the new code has not affected other parts of the software. So retesting is essentially done pre-regression testing. So this is done as the developers start rolling out their code to QA, to the staging environment, and the testers will come in and test that code. And if they find a bug, they report the bug back to the developers. The developer fixes the bug, redeploys it, and at that point, we retest that particular bug. Once all of the retesting and bug fixes are essentially done for that build, then we come back in and we do the regression testing to make sure that all pieces function together and that nothing broke somewhere else in the application. So how do we do regression testing? So there's these different types of regression testing. We've got the automated regression testing, the corrective testing, test management, progressive testing, and integrated testing. And we'll get into those individual pieces in a minute. But the overall, uh, how we actually do the regression testing kind of falls into the a test case prioritization strategy. So first, we want to begin by selecting the test cases that are very critical functionality and covers the core features to identify those that pose the greatest risk of failure. This can be because the failure itself is critical to the system, kind of a high level of risk, or because the functionality is complex and prone to failure. A risk assessment matrix, uh, the RAM, which we talked about in the test strategy presentation, or because the functionality is complex, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so the risk assessment matrix can be used, it can be a useful tool for assigning a risk level. Uh, you plan to perform all critical tests as part of a smoke test and prior to any other regression testing. Here, uh, second, we want to identify the test cases that have a high code coverage or have found a lot of defects in the past and assign these as a higher priority. So you're going to always test essentially the most common defects first and then get into some other features uh, later. Three. We also assign a high priority to functional test cases that verify the happy path or happy day scenarios. Ones which cover the most common use cases for um, AUT, for uh, user acceptance testing, or from end-to-end -end testing. You know, for example, the happy path for a web store would cover all the steps from the user login through the item search, checkout, and payment. Four, given all negative test cases, a default medium priority, also known as the SAD path or negative test cases, which can verify handling of a situation such as entry of a bad username or password in a login attempt. The negative test cases pass when the application handles the error appropriately, such as displaying an error message to the user and preventing the login. Five, likewise, given a default medium priority to all validation tests, including bad path tests, which covered the boundary or edge type cases, as well as uh, corner cases and special values. Uh, these cases ensured that the AUT handles the maximum and minimum values that should process of a positive result. 
a corner case test, a combination of boundary edge cases. So this would be like testing an input field that takes a number. So you would test the highest, uh, highest number you could input and the lowest number you can input, as well as those outside of that range. Six, depending upon the particular application and nature of the type of code changes, you may decide to treat non-functional tests as low priority or regression testing. However, especially when dealing with customer data that should be kept secure, consider prioritizing security testing as high or even critical. Seven, temporarily remove any test cases from the regression suite that will fail due to existing defects, which have not yet been addressed. So this is typically done when you know you've made it to regression testing, you know there are still bugs in the system and that these bugs will impact certain test cases. And in, the, in that situation, you wanna make sure that those are removed from this particular regression cycle. Eight, review all test cases with medium and low priority and raise the priority of any that cover areas of special risk such as security or test cases that verify uh, compliance with regulations. This is critical if you are in companies that have like HIPAA, PCI compliance. Uh, those are things that typically are kind of out of your control or the company's control, whereas government regulations constantly change. So these may have to be looked at again and may be kicked up to a higher level if you know, for example, that a HIPAA change has uh, been applied or there's a new PCI compliance change that you now have to kind of uh, be in compliance with. Nine, to manage the size of the regression test suite, periodically archive obsolete regression tests that no longer serve a purpose. These can be test cases that cover functionality, which no longer exists in the application, or medium and low priority tests that have not revealed any defects in several rounds of regression testing. Now with this one, you have to be careful with this because even though a medium and low priority test may not have revealed defects for multiple regression suites, that potentially can be a good thing because if you some of these low priority or medium tests might be testing functionality that you may not have looked at in months, six months, years, but they might actually cover something that is critical, but it's just something that's not really done all the time, kind of like those one-off test cases. So be very careful if you turn off or remove any medium or low priority test cases. All right, so now let's look at the types of regression testing. So I briefly mentioned these before, but now let's go into them one by one. So software maintenance is an activity which includes enhancements, error corrections, optimizations, and detections of existing features. These modifications can cause the system to work incorrectly. So therefore regression testing becomes critical. It's very necessary in our testing process. And regression testing can be carried out using these techniques. So the first one we're gonna talk about is the corrective regression testing. Here, we analyze the impact of the new code on the software's already existing code. We use a subset of existing test cases to reduce the cost and effort needed for retesting. The next one, retest all regression tests. As the name suggests, this technique of regression testing involves reusing all the test cases and also testing all the possible aspects of this product or software, even when a new change is introduced in the software or not. This technique is time consuming and very tedious. Next, we have selective regression testing. Here, we analyze the impact of new code on the software's already existing code. We use a subset of the existing test cases, again, to reduce the cost and effort needed for retesting. Progressive regression testing. So progressive, this testing is used in situations when modifications are added in the specifications of the product and new test cases are designed. 
Progressive regression testing works effectively when there are changes done in the software application specifications, as well as new test cases are designed. Complete regression testing. This is often carried out when the code changes for modifications or the software updates seep way back into the roots. It is also carried out in cases that are where, where you have multiple changes to the existing code. Next, we have partial regression testing. So partial regression is performed after impact analysis. In this testing process, the new additions of the code as a unit is made to interact with other parts of older existing code. Doing so determines that even with code modifications, the system function at in a kind of silos uh, as desired. And finally, we have unit regression testing. <clears throat> Unit regression testing is executed during the unit testing phase, tests the code as a single unit. It has narrow and focused approach where complex interactions and dependencies uh, outside the unit of the code in this question um, are essentially temporarily blocked. <clears throat> now, most companies kind of do a variation of these types of testing. Typically, though, a lot of them will typically fall within either some type of complete testing uh, or partial testing phase towards the end of the regression cycle. Uh, this partially comes in just based on time. So if you're doing agile and you're doing, say, a three-week sprint, week one is development, week two is development and bug fixes with QA, and then week three would be the full regression testing. Well. If you have time to do the complete testing, you always want to be able to do a complete test of your system. That way you make sure that everything functions the way it's supposed to be and that no new code changes break any uh, pre-existing uh, features. But if you start running into time crunches, then you start having to look at either doing a partial testing of your regression suite or even selective testing. The other thing that comes into play here is if you have uh, even shorter cycles, so say you have two week sprints and you're only making one or two software changes to your application. Well, in that situation, maybe selective testing will work better for you or just maybe even just sticking with unit testing. So it kind of just depends on the situation within your company and what it is that you're really trying to accomplish with your regression testing. Next, we have challenges in regression testing. So I've kind of touched on some of these with our explanations of the types of testing. So while regression testing is a vital element of the QA process, there are a number of challenges that it brings. The first one, which is the biggest one, is it is time consuming. Regression uh, testing can take a lot of time to complete. Regression testing is often involves running extensive tests again, so testers might not be overly um, enthused at having to rerun the tests. It can be very complex. Uh, another thing to consider here is that as products get updated, they can grow quite complex, causing the list of tests in your regression packet to grow you know, to large amounts. And then finally, we have the communication with the business value. So regression testing ensures the existing product features are still in working order. Communicating the value of regression testing to a non-technical leader within your business can be a very difficult task. Uh, executives want to see the product move forward and making a considerable time investment in regression testing to ensure its existing functionality is working can be a hard sell. This one here and the time consuming are probably the two biggest reasons why most companies either don't have a QA department or really spend little or no time on actually testing or regressing their systems. Uh, in many cases, I've seen software shops where they expect the developers to go back and essentially do the regression testing of their software. This is typically a bad idea because 
when developers are writing their code or working on new features or bug fixes, they're kind of siloed in their mindset. They are focused on what they are working on, the particular section of code, or the particular unit tests that apply to the change that they were doing. They typically do not have the time to do a full regression testing of the suite. So when they go actually test the changes or test uh, the bugs, they're going into that specific area of the application and just testing that change to make sure that that area of the application works. This is good to make sure that the bug is compliant, that it's been fixed, but it can have side effects down the road. For example, if you are Amazon and you had someone make a change to the shopping cart where people were to add items to the shopping cart, and for some reason when they added items to the shopping cart, uh, it would put the item in, but it would default the quantity to zero. Well, so someone went in, they fixed the bug, and they go in now, and if you click an item, it puts it in the shopping cart, and it actually has a value of one. However, what they didn't catch is in that particular change, there was a side effect that yes, well, your shopping cart displays the actual quantities correctly, but when you go to checkout, when you actually go to purchase the items, the quantity defaulted back to zero. So in that case, they did not test the full features of the application. They did not do a full happy path test. They just tested that particular page. So. This is another reason why regression testing is needed and why we really have to somehow find a way of explaining these challenges in a way to management or within a company to make sure that enough testing is done to really ensure that when software goes out, software is tested, soft, the functionality is there, and everything is happy and working the way it's supposed to. Next, we have tools. Oh, hang on a second. Sorry about that. Okay, so next we have tools. Now, there's a wide variety of software tools out there for doing testing for doing automation testing, unit testing, and some type of system testing, as well as some form of regression testing. However, one of the biggest things you need to be careful of when using tools is you wanna kinda of ask yourself three things. One, what is the cost? Is it a free tool? Is it a paid tool? Two, is the... Um, is the software going to restrict me to their environment? Am I going to have to learn a new language? Am I going to have to learn a new tool? And three, when I write my tests, am I locked into that system? Can I take these tests and move them to another application or can I move them to another system? Can I export them? Can I do other forms of testing? So. This is just a wide variety of what's currently popular in the market and that people are using. Uh, the biggest one being Selenium, uh, Waiters getting pretty popular, uh, Test Stigma, I've seen a couple of different places now. Test Complete, it's pretty good. You have Cucumber, uh, JBehave, if you're on the Java side of things. And of course, we still have our unit tests. So we have TestNG, JUnit, uh, PHP unit, uh, and like C Sharp unit. And the last topic today is how do we handle bugs? So hopefully by the time you get to the regression testing, most of the uh, bugs have actually been identified and have been addressed. But unfortunately, you know, like with any software tool, any time changes happen, something potentially can break. You know, Murphy's Law, for every one line of code you add to an application, you potentially add six bugs. So you do have to test. But once you get to the regression testing, once you go through the uh, automated test, the manual testing, what happens when you find a bug? Well, you typically would report this in your 
um, project tracking software, be it Jira, Bug Tracker, uh, Software Teams. And the bugs, again, would then be generated. You would have a bug matrix report at the end. Now, this is typically done. The bugs will be reported during the regression testing. And if they're critical enough, then regression has to stop. And if regression stops, that's a huge problem because now you're at the end of the test cycle. You're at the end of the development cycle. The application is due to go out in days and you have now found a critical error. Uh, that basically puts everything to a halt. You now have to get in meetings, get people to look at this and hopefully get it fixed ASAP. And at that point, you're probably only gonna have time now to do a partial or even a siloed um, regression, if you can even do regression at all. If you uh, find just minimal bugs uh, or minor or medium level bugs, when you get to the end of regression, then what you do is you have, you sit down and you look at the matrix report. You look at the bug matrix report. At that point, the management has to make the decision, okay, do we send these back to development? Is this something that is critical enough that we have to fix now? Or do we put it into the next track? Do we move these bugs into the next sprint, roll the software out and move forward? And then finally, sometimes you have cosmetic bugs and cosmetic bugs typically can be fixed quickly. And for that, you don't necessarily have to do a full regression test. You could essentially do a um, user acceptance testing at the end and just ensure that the visual components of the pages have been corrected. So in that case, you would probably do just a handful of happy path tests to make sure that you make it all the way through your application. Are there any questions? None for me. None for me, but I'm going to have to go back and look through the rest of your the presentations on the on this whole series. It looks pretty good, uh, and I'd like to see how things are being done in previous steps. So, pipe my interest for sure. Yeah, uh, Michael, in your experience, how often do you have to update your regression suite? Because I know there is always changes in code. Well, this is so it's kind of interesting. So, whoops. Um, so, this area here time consuming, complex, and communication. So, with regression testing, the biggest problem I have uh, is, for example, say you're dealing with a legacy application and your company has a large set of test cases against that application. And then they decide to go in and throw in a new page or they decide to add a kind of a major, uh, a, a new field that is a, a main requirement to the test flow. Uh, in fact, this just happened to me recently and it caused an impact to over 20,000 test cases. So the short answer that we did for that was we hard coded the tests, the happy path solution into the page flow to get us out the door and working. The downside to that is we have no negative test cases. I cannot change the value for that particular test flow. Um, and it typically also boils down to what type of framework and solutions you had in place. So in my particular situation, the environment I have to deal with is I have all my test data in spreadsheets. Five years ago, the business analysts and the uh, PMs all made the decision that all our test data had to be in spreadsheets, did not need to be in databases. Uh, 
partially because we had no room left in the database. We were running out of space all over the place uh, in our company. I just had a business meeting yesterday with the, all the powers that be, and starting Monday, we will now be moving over to a, a SQL Server database for automation testing. So I'll be able to export all my data sets into a database, and that will make this a lot easier. But that being said though, it kind of depends on the implementation. So if you're using a record playback uh, type of framework or type of solution for your automated testing or your regression testing, then any changes to the application, you're gonna have to go back and re-record all the impacted test cases or test suites that are affected by that code change. If they're making changes to the pages every sprint, you're gonna be redoing your test cases every single sprint. So that gets very costly. If you go the other route and you go the, kind of the more um, abstract approach, which is where my test generated suite has gone, you use a combination of a hybrid testing, be it database, uh, be it uh, data-driven testing, and then you also use a combination of page object models where you actually put the page functionality at the page level, and then you let the data kind of drive the actual test cases. So if you include data for a field, then that tells the test case that, oh, hey, I need to input data into this field. So when I'm on this page, that field should be there. If you have lots of changes to your pages, then all you need to do is update your page object and all your tests still work. So minimal impact. So you can make changes to that and really do that in about four to eight hours, one day of a sprint, and all your test regression tests still work. When you're doing manual testing and they're making constant changes to this, you're gonna have to go back and update all your test cases um, and all your test scenarios to apply the new changes. And that could also be uh, a major impact from sprint to sprint. And it just kind of all boils down to how often you're actually making changes to an application. Because if you're dealing with an old legacy application, chances are it may get touched once a quarter, it may get touched once a year or not at all. You're just keeping, you're just running the test to make sure that the system environments are still working, maybe the operating systems uh, updates haven't broken anything, or if it's like a Java application that you can you know, upgrade Java and it won't break anything. Uh, it just kind of depends on the level of testing and what your application does. So would you say uh, like if the a project is still in like, like let me say in infant stage, then there is no need to do a regression suite, isn't it? Uh, I, yes and no. So depending upon your test architecture, uh, you could do some simple record playback and test just some basic happy path functionality. So you could still inject some basic level of testing. But if they are constantly changing the page flow or changing the tests or basically changing the user scenarios for the application, um, I would say, no, don't do any testing or test automation at that time. Uh, you would have to do basically user acceptance testing. You'd have to just do some manual testing, some smoke testing, make sure everything's functional. If, however, the application is a little more stable. So if the application is like in flux, like you said, it's early infancy, I would typically say that the, that particular software is probably still in a kind of a beta, maybe even an alpha version. Um, if they've just thrown a quick proof of concept out to the customer, I would still even consider that alpha, maybe even beta. Uh, at that particular stage, no, I probably would not do any automated testing. Uh, I would actually try to define what I can as far as the user stories go for some user acceptance testing. Uh, and if it is stable enough, you know, maybe record, uh, you know, maybe 10, 20 
uh, Selenium test using the record playback tool, just so you have at least some type of um, automated scripting so that you have some type of happy path at that particular stage. And if it changes, then one, what that kind of gives you is it gives you a snapshot. So then the next cycle through, if things change, you can go back to your test and say, okay, this has changed. But if you go back to the documentation or you go back to what code changes have actually been applied, if those don't jive with what you're seeing or from what you're seeing from the previous test run to now, then you can actually take those early recorded test cases and throw it back to the development and say, okay, this was last sprint. This was the test flow. This was the page flow. This is how the application functioned. Based on the current requirements, the current software changes, this is what we're seeing now. However, this does not match what the requirements say. What the requirements say actually still match our first set of recordings. So why is this not working? So you still want to kind of have some level of audit at each sprint, regardless if you're doing manual or automated testing. Gotcha. Cool. Thanks. No problem. Any other questions? All right. With that. So just to quickly recap. So we talked about what is regression testing? You know, regression testing, again, <clears throat> is the process of rerunning functional and non-functional tests to ensure that our previously developed and tested software still performs after any particular code changes. Uh, regression testing is typically done by a QA team, and it can also be include development because uh, developers can run their unit tests to make sure that everything functions correctly. Uh, regression testing is essentially done at the end of the test cycle. This is after all potential bug fixes have been addressed, all code changes have been put into the system, and all the software has been deployed to the QA or the UAT environment, your staging environment, which is very similar to production. So you're actually testing very close to production. We, again, um, regression testing, why is it important? because without it, we are not testing the full application end-to-end. -end. We are not making sure that the full application suite works with all the code changes. Uh, we looked at how to do regression testing, you know, the different stages. Um, we also talked about the different types of regression testing, the corrective, retesting, the selective, the progressive, the complete, partial, and again, unit regression testing. We talked about some of the challenges that were in regression testing, where it can be very time consuming. Uh, it can get very complex uh, as the application grows. And it's very hard to communicate why regression testing is important to the business. So you gotta get creative. You gotta really show uh, the impact that regression testing can have when you test a system. And that again can be from using a lot of the documentation that we have talked about throughout this series, be it the test strategy document, the test plan, our test cases, um, the, uh, the matrix, um, the bug uh, um, tracking uh, reports that you can throw out there. Uh, we talked about the different types of tools, uh, touched on those, uh, Selenium, Waiter, Test Complete. These are just some tools out there to help you quickly uh, build your test cases and build a test suite that you can push a button and run your tests in an automated way at the end of a sprint. And then we also kind of walk through the bug process when you run into uh, bugs through regression. Now this wraps up the um, our series on implementing testing into your development workflow. We have covered a lot of topics along this journey. And if you have missed any of the classes or you just would like some additional information, go back and review the videos. And if you have any questions, hit us up on Slack or you can hit us up um, 
on Facebook and some of our other pages. So with that, I'd like to thank you. Uh, I know your time is important. And again, if you wanna discuss any of these topics further, you can send us questions, comments to any of these uh, locations, info at developerner.com, uh, HTTPS developerner.com, contact us. Uh, we're still on Twitter at developerner. We're also still on uh, Facebook at facebook.com slash developerner. And we're also on um, YouTube now. Um, Rob, do you remember the link to the YouTube page? Uh, not directly. If you go to YouTube and search for uh, the developer channel, uh, and I think we have it out on the, it's also out on the website. I'll have to add it there at some point. I'll throw that one there. No problem. And our videos are also on Vimeo too. If you have a Vimeo account, check them out there. Uh, our goal is making every developer better. Thanks guys. Have a great day.